All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We will pay no attention to the folks in the back. Please get your get your lunch, get comfortable. I want to welcome you all over here um, to this jointly sponsored event between Fletcher and Tisch College. I'm Diane Ryan. I'm the Associate Dean for Programs and Administration. And on behalf of our Dean, Dana Cunningham, I'm really excited to welcome you to today's Civic Life Lunch Talk called The Power of Mistakes and Failures with former ambassador, our wonderful guest, uh, Susie Levine. So before we get started, I want to uh, draw attention to all of the ambassadors in the audience. So if you are an ambassador, please raise your hand. Uh, so uh, specifically, I want to welcome our Dean Emeritus, Alan Solomon from Tisch College, who was also uh, ambassador to Spain and Andorra back in the day. Um, so some of I see some of my former students in here, which is exciting, um, who know that I'm a person who uh, researches, writes, and teaches about leadership and leader development. And they hear me talk about uh, the fact that nothing comes without some kind of pain. Uh, like when you go to the gym and you're working out, you have to tear your muscles a little bit in order to build your muscles. And like with leadership development, sometimes you have to fail a little bit as a way to spring forward and learn from it. So that's what we are going to um, talk about today, the role of failure in developing leaders and how we learn from our mistakes and actually use them as opportunities and, and change our thinking about them. So our guest ambassador Levine is here to explore these ideas on a micro and macro level with us. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a senior executive with 30 plus years of experience leading global companies and organizations across diverse industries and functions, including technology, near to my heart, cybersecurity, government, nonprofits, higher education, and more. She's currently a policy mentor at Brown University and soon to be an adjunct professor at the University of Washington, go Huskies. Um, she serves on the board of Publicist Group, a $19 billion global corporation, is on and is on advisory boards of Open Classrooms and Cindio. She has had many leadership roles throughout her career, including as United States Ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. She was commissioner of the Washington State Employment and Security Department, acting assistant secretary at the US Department of Labor and vice president of sales and marketing at Expedia and several other roles. But over the course of her career, she's overseen the development and deployment of billions of dollars of grants, new government regulations, foreign direct investment and new benefits programs. Uh, so this is also very interesting that she's led large technology rollups, fought historic fraud attacks by recovering hundreds of millions of, of stolen dollars, secured commitments from Swiss industry to build U.S. apprenticeship programs, led the rollout of Washington State's groundbreaking paid family and medical leave program, thank you very much, uh, and developed innovative DEI and workforce programs. But perhaps... One of the most fun facts about her is that she was the first U.S. diplomat to speak at the F up night. <laughs> uh, you can fill in the blank. Um, I'm really looking forward to her talk today. I hope you will do. So please let us give a warm welcome to Ambassador Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, so hi, I'm Susie. Nice to see you all here today really humbling to have folks come out because you don't know me from Adam, right? Um, Alan's the one who's like local and the ambassador here. Uh, and you got some other great ambassadors here regionally. So thank you. That deeply honors me. Raise your hand if in the past five days you have made a mistake or had a failure. Past two days. Past day. Awesome, sweet. We're all in comp you know, we're in competition with one another. Who screw up was better? Not enough people talk about failure. So again, raise the hands again, past day. All right, I'm not gonna pick on you, Diane. What is your name? I'm sorry, I took you, got your mid bite. I'll go right behind you. What's your name? Andres. 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 What did you learn from that failure? Um I learned that um, there's a different approach. I can approach a, a problem in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the approach that I took 
giving my daughter some advice mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't uh, translate into the results I was hoping for. And so I reconsidered and I said, you know, there's a different way of approaching it. Perhaps maybe, I don't know, maybe not as challenging or mm -hmm. confrontational. Uh, and uh, so I'm determined to uh, get it right the next time. Good job, Andres. As a daughter, I appreciate that. <laughs> and as a mom, I'm listening to you. What is your name? Alex. Alex. So Alex, why did you fail? I didn't meet the expectation I met for myself. You or I the, wanted for myself. So there's the different way to ask the question, right? What did you learn? Why did you fail? This is what we face in our society. There's so much of a focus and a scarlet letter F on failure. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a combination of things. I'm going to talk about international perspectives on failure. This might be failing, actually, which is exciting. <laughs> um, I think I'm pressing the, the correct button. Again. Trying again. There we go. Global views of failure. I'm going to talk about famous failures. And then I'll talk about how I faced failures, both in system failures and also in social media failures, which Lord knows there are far too many of those out there. So in thinking about global views of failure, as the ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein, you get a sense of what's their culture. And it isn't how do you fit into the local culture, it's how you might be able to understand it, create bridges with them, and what value can we bring? And so with that, in working with the Swiss, when you hear them talk about Swiss pre precision, performance, right? Watches, which mm -hmm. require super meticulous, teeny tiny little pieces and parts. Actually, they took the watch manufacturers and also turned them into nanotechnology manufacturers. It is so for real. That whole like Swiss family Robinson and Swiss mm -hmm. knives, it's super, super real. They are perfectionists and it's beautiful. But it also is an interesting challenge with regards to innovation. Because to innovate, you need to fail. And what was one of the funny things that I experienced was um, meeting with a gentleman from Roche, who uh, the CEO from Roche used to be a gentleman named Severin Schwann. He's since retired. And he celebrated failure. Every quarter, he took the team with the biggest failure out to lunch. <laughs> and it was so unique. And I remember him talking at the Swiss Economic Forum about this. And you see all the other executives there, and they were, they were kind of perplexed. Like, how could you do this? And yet it was twofold. One is he wanted to foster, do innovative things, try things that are hard, and know that failure is OK. But it was also super economical. For him, he didn't want them putting good money after bad. So he needed to let them know that pulling the plug is okay before you spend more money. So he really set a tone there that was pretty unique at the time. Since then, since I was there 2014 and 2017, there has been a lot more of a startup culture and a lot more innovation coming out of Switzerland. There is still a hesitancy. I mean, some of it also stems from the fact that you have legacy and heritage money that's 500 years old going through generations and they're loath to lose it. But there is a lot more innovation and a little bit more acceptance around failure. And I also, from other colleagues across the globe, know that the United States is unique in its ability to focus on and foster innovation and a culture of failure. And if you talk to venture capitalists, if you're in trying to get investment funding, they actually really appreciate when people have failed first, fail fast, fail cheaply. That's what you hear a lot of. And in the US, what I would talk about with the Swiss is that there's no stigma associated with it. In fact, people often use it as a badge of honor, a little notch on their belt. What you also have is it's an important way to learn. As I asked Andres, right, what did you learn? And I hope that your daughter might have either heard that or you can fast forward to that in the recording of this session. <laughs> and in addition to that, it's OK to fail at funding, too. VC firms, most of their money that they initially outlay, they lose, but they look for the unicorns where they ultimately will get that back and then some. So let's talk about famous folks failure. And I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time on this because frankly, this is just a sampling. Every person that you might see in the news, on TV, in a film, wherever, I guarantee that they have had some colossal failure. 
it would always surprise people when they would hear me talk about various ways in which I stumble because they just assume that to get there, you have to have had a really easy path or you've had to have had a really smooth direction. And certainly there's people with really compelling origin stories, but I'll tell you, not only do they probably have a compelling origin story, but I guarantee that they've experienced profound failure and they learned from it and they grew from it. So famous folks, Abe Lincoln, he lost a lot of elections before he became president. You have Steve Jobs, also super famous, super successful dude, but he got fired from Apple. And he had a couple of technology projects that really went off the rails. There was Pixar technology before there was Pixar, the film studio. You have Lady Gaga, who first started performing, I love the hair, I'm from New Jersey, so this is super compelling for me. <laughs> When I went to my prom, by the way, um, I'm 5'4", and I went with a gentleman who was 6'8", and with hair and heels, I was pretty close. <laughs> but that's not me. That's Lady Gaga, and she's so fabulous. So she started performing when she was 14 in bars, and she got signed, but then she got dropped. But she stuck with it, and within just a couple more years, she was winning Grammys for Interscope, or with Interscope, for herself with Interscope. Very important clarification there. Michael Jordan, he famously talks about failure all the time. He got cut from his high school team. Can you imagine how bad that coach feels? <laughs> right? Think about that. I cut Michael Jordan. Um, and he talks about how many shots he's lost, 9,000 shots, losing 300 games, 26 times. He was entrusted with the final winning shot, and he missed it. Anybody go to any of those games? I, I didn't. I wish I had been there. But, and that's why he succeeds. He learns from that failure. So as you think about, and I love that pretty much everybody's hands went up. And if your hand didn't go up, that was a failure because you actually probably did do some sort of mistake <laughs> or failure and you missed it. So you're going to hit it in the next couple of days. You should get the fallout from it, from whoever saw you just do that. And I'm kidding. Nobody's watching. They're just listening. <laughs> so how I faced failure. Um, and actually, before I go into this, I'll share with you my failure that I had just yesterday. So I was presenting at Brown to a group of students and I was talking about some leadership principles. And one of the things I talked to them about was, uh, I was I was sort of modeling how I come into a community, how I come into a team, because I've had the blessing and fortune to be hired in at the top of an organization where I have to then kind of win over the organization. And I, instead of talking about it, I showed how I did it. So I created the team, the virtual team in that room in my session yesterday. And one of the principles I shared was, you know, I understand this place is like family. Here's my family. I'm excited to be a part of this family. And I got the greatest gift of piece of feedback from a woman in the room. And this wasn't so much a failure as it was more of a mistake. And I learned. And she said to me, she said, you know, I appreciate where you were going with that. And I appreciate the sentiment that you might have had. But for me, I don't want my workplace to be a family. I want my workplace to be my work. And I want my family to be my family. And she said, you may want to shift your framing on that and help people understand what is it that you want to achieve in that space, but don't necessarily define us as your family. I may get to that place with you, but let's not start there. <laughs> and that was such a gift. And I've learned and grown even just in the past 24 hours from that gift. One of the keys to mistakes and failure is feedback and creating an environment in which feedback can be welcome. So first thing I'm gonna do is talk about systemic failure. And this is my first time actually really presenting to a public audience on this. So feedback is very welcome, please. Um, and if I get a little emotional, it's because it was an emotional time. And today's a very special day, it's leap day. So technically it's actually the first anniversary of the first COVID death that was reported in the United States. And it was in Washington state. And Washington state was at the tip of the spear. We were the first state to detect a COVID case. We were the first state to have a COVID death that was reported. They subsequently determined that there had been prior deaths in other places, but not reported. It was also the first state, and I was running at the time, as Diane shared, the Employment Security Department for Washington state. My big accomplishment that I was supposed to do over that job was to build and launch the new paid family and medical leave program. And I'll talk a little bit about that and sort of the environmental conditions at the time. But I also had the awesome responsibility of running unemployment insurance, as well as other workforce programs. So anybody who saw the news anytime from 
basically March of 2020 until even now, knows that unemployment insurance was a little bit in the news. <clears throat> and I'm actually gonna call out somebody who's on Zoom right now, who was an incredible partner through all of this. And that's a gentleman named John Palish. Diane also mentioned I served as the acting assistant secretary at the start of the Biden administration for running the Employment and Training Administration. Well, I took the reins from John, who was working for the Trump administration and really had quite the yeoman's task in that role. So I deeply appreciate his decision to join this Zoom today. Um, and we actually didn't talk in advance of this. I wanted to kind of get his feedback afterwards because we had very different experiences from it. So let me share with you this. In government, sometimes good is not available and yet you're still accountable for bad, even though worse was possible. Does that make sense in terms of logic? Yeah. So I'll talk about both my fraud prince and my big sister in this. So my big sister, Hannah, she said to me at the outset, very prophetically, Susie, <clears throat> you are not gonna do a good job. Thanks, sis, that's really great. I'm feeling awesome right now, but you're gonna do the best job that's possible. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized that after I was done that job that I realized the power of this statement. And it was so, so true. And so when people are going into a really, really challenging time or a crisis, it's helpful for them to know two things. One, doing the best job possible is critical. And there still may be critics out there, but we gotta do the work. And in the public sector, it's especially hard because privacy keeps us from sharing the whole story. And that privacy is also important. To give you a timeline, starting on January 1st, paid family medical leave, like I was describing with Washington State, we launched it on time and on budget, which was extraordinary. And it was a huge project. Mm -hmm. However, it was with 10 times the forecasted demand against what we had done. So all of a sudden we're underwater already in January of 2020. And I'm trying to sort of set the tone so that you guys can feel stressed like I do right now, <laughs> sweating a little bit. Thank goodness I have a nice big coat on, you can't see. And um, we actually moved our unemployment insurance customer service team over to the paid family medical leave group when we were training them and they were in that training. So we even had fewer bodies on our unemployment insurance team when the pandemic hit. So when things started in February to get a little nutty and we had our team members going into emergency training and emergency preparation sessions, we had our team working with John Palish's uh, team in the federal government on what rules need to be changed so that we can provide more benefits to more people because people were starting to leave work and or workplaces were shutting down or counties were shutting down. Washington state was the first one doing all of those things. We didn't have a full-blown plan on this. And things started to get more and more intense. When the CARES Act passed from the, from the Congress, extending unemployment and benefits to people who had never had those benefits before, people who did not have a relationship with their employers. Raise your hand here if you've ever done work where you receive a 1099 for tax purposes instead of a W-2. Yeah, so that's you, right? That's that kind of work. And all of a sudden, they were now eligible for unemployment assistance. However, the language in the bill didn't say anything about here's the time frame in which this needs to be built and delivered. So March 26th, it passed. March 27th, the phone calls came in. Where's my money? 146 calls per second. Think about that for a second. 146 calls per second coming into our call center. So all this is going on. We then really speedily launched. Now, give you a sense, since 1938 to 2020, we had launched one major benefits program for unemployment insurance. We had iterated on it, but one major program. We then had to launch three programs in three weeks. And then over the course of the next 10 months, we launched five more programs. Holy moly. What we didn't have though was a lot of insight. And I'll talk about it in a second. The system basically imagined you're driving along in your little VW bug, and then all of a sudden they're like, okay, that's great. You're kind of low on your tank, and we're gonna put a Big Mac truck on top, and you need to drive faster and further. That's what it felt like in what we were dealing with at that time. Then, May 12th, 
So this is, sorry, this gives you a sense of the, the speed of and speed and increase. We had a 28X increase in demand for unemployment insurance in two and a half weeks. To give you a sense of the 08, 09 peak, it was 26,000. That's during the recession. So that's how much demand we drove in that short period of time. The environmental conditions, as I was saying, they were already under pressure. My team was concerned about their own health and I was concerned about my team's health. I kept having to have cleaning teams go in when we had to have a COVID outbreak, right? And then we had to transition within two weeks also to all remote, remote work. Fortunately, we had laptops for everybody. It was something that we had done the prior year. So it was actually relatively easy to do that. But we then had, in addition to those initial points in time, we then had the George Floyd murder on May 25th, which then created an enormous amount of stress and strain on the team. We ended up hiring a thousand people in about four months and we had to onboard them all virtually. And then every week, the policy changed because the conditions changed and the law changed and or the conditions of the law changed. So we had to deal with, for the first time, multiple concurrent benefits. So this is my Peloton. <laughs> May 12th, 9.30, this is where I was when I got a text on my phone from one of my colleagues. And it said, hey, Susie, why did I get a letter asking me for more information so that I could receive unemployment insurance benefits. We were at a meeting earlier today and I saw you there. I'm not unemployed. <laughs> and there's always a modicum of fraud when you have a benefit or if you're an e-commerce company or you're anybody in business, there is a modicum of fraud. We had had a little trickle, but this, this one was different. So I used my computer, which you would see my tray here ordinarily with my laptop. I looked up all my colleagues on, my, on the cabinet for the governor. I looked up other prominent people from across Washington state and every single one of them had benefits filed that day in their name. I realized what was going on. We were being attacked. And so I went to pull the emergency break for the first time since 1938 to stop paying benefits. But it was like watching the taillights of a getaway car because the money had already gone to the bank to get distributed out to the recipients. That was about $250 million that day. So the next day with the governor's support, I did put on the brakes and we stopped benefits to 1.2 million people, people in desperate need, people not sure how they were gonna pay their rent, people not sure how they were gonna get their food on the table. 1.2 million people or $1.2 billion. That was my decision that I had to make on May 13th. Fortunately, the governor had my back and we stopped benefits for several days while we tried to figure out what was going on. Notified my colleagues, was working in close coordination with the US Attorney's Office. There had already been some inklings of what was going on from the US Department of Labor. Massachusetts was the next one attacked, Pennsylvania after that. But it actually, what we ultimately learned was that it was happening across the country. We were just the first ones to really detect the massive nature of it. Ultimately, $650 million was stolen from us. We were able to prevent $1.5 billion from going out. And we were able to get returned 423 million of it, which was extraordinary. In those 10 months, we ended up having $10 billion in benefits, $14 billion going out in benefits to about 1.1 million people. So we've recovered 65% of the losses. And that as compared with Michigan had $2.8 billion mm -hmm. stolen, Arizona 4.4 billion, California 8.7 billion. So ultimately we set up for the very first time a recovery unit. We had never had a recovery muscle in our system. We had never had a mechanism by which to communicate with the banks. I was on speed dial with many of the banks I used, I used LinkedIn to reach the CEO of Green Dot to get money back from Green Dot. We used every and any tool that we had in our arsenal. It was a systemic failure. There were so many things from which to learn, but also so many things from which to grow. And ultimately, Washington State went from about 16% of fraud on our applications in that April-May timeframe to less than 0.5%. 
And this was on the dark web. Don't mess with Washington. <laughs> Love this, right? This is a good moment. This is one of the many press conferences I ended up doing. This is my fraud prints. <laughs> So what ended up happening was it was a one of the sources. It ultimately was many different sources. It was a, part of it was a Nigerian scam run by this guy, who was a government official um, from Nigeria, who uh, got hundreds of thousands of dollars, but ultimately got caught and got put in jail. Um, but one of the things that was really horrible was the um, a certain talk show radio hosts decided that that was my prince, and that we were in cahoots, and that it was an inside job and that this was my special guy in addition to my husband. Let me just say, I don't know this guy. <laughs> and, uh, and there you go. So lessons learned from my big sister and my fraud prince. One, technology can be used for good or evil. Mm -hmm. Diane, you as somebody who worked in IT know that very, very well. The identity data, every one of you, I guarantee that somewhere on the dark web is information about you. And what they have done from one of the key things with Washington State, we were never hacked. We never had our information stolen from us. It was information stolen from Equifax breach, Primera breach, Target breach, that was compiled in sophisticated ways by international criminals and then sold. And that's what happened. Um, the race against fraudsters is never, ever over. So for those people who are like, okay, now we can scale back our resources. Oh, no, you can't. You need to figure out more and more sophisticated ways because it's always a race with them. It's really important, even if you're in a com competition with somebody. So, excuse me, what is your name? Richard. Richard. So let's say you and I both have businesses and I get something happens to me from a fraud standpoint. It's really important that I share with you the nature of what happened because I guarantee they're going to go to you next. They're going to look at who's locked down and go on to the next one. And that way we can truly prevent it instead of having it just go to the next one who's not ready. And we saw this happen all across the United States when states weren't ready, they were getting attacked. And there were states still being attacked by the spring of 2021 because they hadn't locked down. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what we learned was there is at two ends of the spectrum, security versus accessibility. We could have made it so hard to get benefits that only people with a retinal scan and a thumbprint could get them. But then guess who's only gonna get those benefits? Not people who don't have digital access not people in the deepest needs. One of the examples of things that we shut down, at one point we looked at one of the characteristics and that was multiple people sending benefits via the same address. It's like, oh, we better stop that. Guess who sends multiple benefits to the same address? People in shared housing, tribes. At one point we decided, oh my gosh, this is a lot of it's going to Texas. Well, it turns out that Green Dot was in Texas and a lot of it was going to Green Dot. So we better stop all the banks in Texas or at least flag them for further review. Guess who else is in Texas? USAA, military bank. So all of a sudden, all those military families had a slower time. We ultimately resolved that one, we fixed that one. But these are some of the challenges, security and accessibility. And it has to be done with consideration to diversity, equity, and inclusion. When you're doing ID verification, the initial software development was white, really taught faced young men, I'm, I'm sure of it, because they don't know how to handle jowls. They don't know how to handle people of color. They've worked on that, but we need more work done on that to make sure that these systems with automatic verification are properly assessing if they're doing it from a facial recognition standpoint, the accuracy of faces. And you have to have diversity in that process, in the learning process for those systems. And again, sometimes the decision is between bad and worse. So I have a request for you. The next time you see an article criticizing a government official, doesn't matter what party, government official, have some grace. Think about the fact that they have made a bad decision, but what was the alternative? And people don't often have the grace to think about between bad and worse, because oftentimes when you have a leader, the good decisions got made by the people working for them. And the bad decision was the one that they ultimately had to make that was really, really hard. So if I could wave my magic, magic wand, I'd say lend a hand instead of pointing fingers. I mentioned that data did not get stolen from us. No, it got stolen from our state auditor instead, several months later, who was handling the data as a part of their audit. What I wish when the auditor had kicked off her audits is that she would have said, we have a lot of resources. 
I know we need to audit you and keep oversight, but how can we do that? And how can we help you? How can we lend you your expertise mm -hmm. in this moment of complete and utter failure? I would have loved for law enforcement from across the United States happened in the Biden administration, and we did it right at the outset of the beginning of 2021. I wish that the Trump administration, instead of blaming us as states for doing it, had said, we are going to put the FBI, we are going to put the CIA, we are going to put all our U.S. attorneys and all of our law enforcement to bear on supporting and helping you. We did not feel that. Instead, we had auditors coming to us. Lending a hand, not pointing a finger. I also have a recommendation. If you ever have a friend who's going through a crisis and you don't know if they did good or bad, you just don't know, right? There's a story out there or in social media, they're, somebody's canceling them, whatever, and they're your friend or your family member, you don't have to judge them one way or the other. You don't have to say, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And you don't have to say, what a knucklehead you are. You can send them a note and just say, I'm thinking about you. I imagine this is really hard. And that'll be super meaningful for them. Crazy meaningful. I guarantee it. And it doesn't mean that you've judged them. It just means that you've loved them. Next up. I would love for the super nerdy geeky thing, the administration of UI to be better. First, I've had a federal solution. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And for um, the Europeans handled this much better than we did. We fired everybody. Everybody got on unemployment insurance. As opposed to in Europe, they funded the business to keep people attached to the business and keep them employed, even though they were not going into work. We need a, a better and a different system. And there's a lot of conversations about that. Similarly, how do we learn from past breaches around fraud? So this is a lot of the like nerdy government stuff on this. The other thing is with the Defense Act or with we think about military solutions, I ended up actually calling in the governor, called in the National Guard to help us with identity verification. Why can't we have an economic core, an economic National Guard? So Washington State actually has created a reserve core of adjudicators. So you get special training so that if you are needed in an emergency, you serve. But you're doing insurance. How cool is that? I'm sorry, I'm a nerd. I think insurance is cool. <laughs> Top 10 learnings going from the frying pan and the fire. Again, love and listen to your team members. There's a great podcast if you ever get a chance. Michael Lewis uh, does Against the Rules. And there's one of them that features um, one of the people, Todd Park, who was the original CIO or CTO for the Obama administration. And he talks about going seven layers deep in his organization and actually really learning and understanding what's going on in the organization. That's how you do it. You ask the people who are really actually doing the work and then you understand the problems that are really actually happen happening. And you also talk to the people who are personally affected by what you're doing or will be doing. Equity needs to be a pervasive, pervasive lens from the beginning with regards to decision-making. If we had had a proper Spanish language version of our site, we actually would have addressed a lot of the concerns that we ran into, not a majority, but a lot of the concerns. We did not from the get-go. <laughs> Things like identifying your stakeholders and investing the time to keep them up to speed. For me, it was the legislature. It was community members, community leaders. We didn't. We were in such a crisis mode that it was hard to even speak to anybody. My family, never mind anybody else. But bringing them in and taking that time, finding that time is really critical. So these are some of the key things, truth and transparency. But like I said, an environment with a freedom to learn from failure and give honest feedback really does yield the best results. Um, I'll share these slides. Jessica will be able to do that. And you guys can see these also in the recording. Because uh, I want to share also systemic fixes, FEMA for the economy, a reserve core, consistent systems across the United States. We have 56 systems. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for being here. Um, and standards for human centered design. Put people at the center of the systems, not the systems at the center of the people. A really, really critical facet of looking not just within technology, not just with benefits, but in all of the work that you do, that is a relevant principle that I encourage you to consider. American Rescue Plan in, was intended to address that. Okay, so now let's talk about um, how it felt. And I described, this is a great speech that Theodore Roosevelt gave called The Man in the Re Arena. And basically it speaks to this point of really nobody outside the arena can understand what it feels like being in there. I encourage you to look it up and read it slowly. I'm not gonna do that right now, 
but most importantly is it is this sense of um and I, and I imagine members of the military feel this as well like when you're in the trenches and it's so hard from outside the trenches to understand what it feels like in there um and i don't i hope that none of you ever have to feel that but no a you actually are not alone or if you're not in the arena have patience and like i said grace and love for those who are in it so let's talk about social media failure and swiss ski le ski lessons um this is a good example of even when you're correct you still might be wrong okay so let's just say i talked about swiss precision Swiss love skiing. They really, really do. And they're really good at it. There's a reason why in a small teeny tiny country, the size population wise of Washington state, they have a lot of gold medals. January 2nd, awesome day of skiing. This is my kid. There we are. It's bluebird ski day, right? And I launched my Facebook page talking about this awesome bluebird day. But I also asked people to help me navigate the chaos of the Swiss ski lift lines. Okay. Chaos and Swiss skiing in the same sentence is like a declaration of war. <laughs> January 3rd was a horrible day of failure. <laughs> I just want to say like this picture, how flattering is this? <laughs> Not at all. I look like a lunatic. They talk, like I gesticulate a lot so it's easy to capture loony photos of me and they got it. They nailed it. There's chaos on the Swiss ski lift. But here's what I really love is that what they said, and it's a little black down here, I don't know why, but basically I was accused of a diplomatic etiquette mistake. <laughs> I wasn't wrong. <laughs> and in fact, there have been articles since then talking about how right I was. <laughs> but it was such a failure. Alan, did you ever experience anything like this? Oh, never. <laughs> What I loved was when I took this to the person who headed up public affairs for the State Department, a gentleman named Rick Sengel, and I was, you know, sort of a little bit nervous about sharing it with him. He's like, oh, my God, that's awesome. Matthew did that in the UK and so and so did this in this place. And I was the first I was the first diplomat to use social media in Switzerland. And so they didn't know what to make of me, for one. And most importantly, they didn't know what to make of the social media aspect of it. And what I didn't know culturally was how important this was. And while I was right, I was not correct. And the special moment that is not documented here was we went to go get sleds on the third and the Swiss are very um, non-confrontational, right? It helps when you're a neutral country. <laughs> and this gentleman comes up and I'm, I have my kids, I have my dog, I have my husband, and he comes up and he gets in my face and he wags his finger at me. And he says, you have no right. I'm like, excuse me, you have no right. I'm like, what? He goes, and he doesn't say a word. I'm like, okay, is this about what happened on social, like the, the, the news article? He goes, yes, you have no right. I was like, please look at the whole post because the post does compliment Switzerland. And I'm so sorry that I offended you. So bad day bad moment. This guy then introduced himself. I'm like, hi, I'm Susie Levine. Hi, I'm Walter. I won't give his last name. I'll keep him safe that way. Um, and then on the way out of the store with our sleds in tow, he sort of gave a sheepish wave to me. Um, and I think that he realized his very un-Swiss experience with me at that time, but he helped me tell this story very well. So that's January 3rd. Now let's talk about the recovery. The recovery happened on, if the button will press, let me try this one more time. There we go. Went to sleep. March 3rd, a fabulous day of recovery. I became the only government official in the whole wide world from any country to have my own snow groomer. <laughs> snow Force One got christened. So the beautiful thing, three benefits of screwing up like I did. One, it became an icebreaker pun completely intended. <laughs> the next week after January 3rd, I saw the president of Switzerland and he said to me, so how was your skiing? <laughs> I got lots of new followers in social media and Alba Bowden, to their credit, got a ton of press from that moment and invited me back to christen Snow Force One. So this is me with my snow groomer 
and my pilot, and I actually did get to drive a snow, groom snow groomer, and they would actually trot this out at different diplomatic events. And yes, we had ski diplomatic events. It was pretty friggin' cool. <laughs> and, uh, and they would have the snow groomer ready for me. Um, so that's how you recover from these things. Failure is just another word for growing. With that, I thank you so much for having me. I love to take your questions, please. And I imagine there might be some Zoom questions. So Jessica, will you represent Zoom questions as well? And if people need to go, I know that classes are happening and people are here for a moment. So please don't hesitate to, to take off if you need to. And please share your name as well. Hi, I'm Giovanna. Thank Hi, you so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious to hear more about the reconciliation process, especially when it's like on the macro level, right? Like the failure you shared. Yeah. Um, like, how do you reconcile on a personal level, on the team level? What does that look like through those failures? Tell me more about what you think the word reconcile means. I think it means a lot to repair. How do you repair those individual relationships? How do you make people mm -hmm. who, in the instance and the example you gave of failing, to provide benefits to people who really needed it in the moment and may have had their lives affected? Yeah drastically like how then is that repaired afterwards well there's the technical repair of that so in that failure is building better systems both in the moment fixing the systems and a lot of that was done with duct tape and and, and toothpicks i mean it was insane in terms of what we had to do to prop up our systems at that moment to deliver as quickly as we could what people needed desperately and then there is a longer term systemic solution, which we put into place with the American Rescue Plan with $2 billion going in to fix the system, with having teams across the US government under the Biden administration go in and help and work with states and also create some central support services and to bring law enforcement to bear. So that's sort of an overall systemic fix. But from an individual team member fix, it was really hard. My team members and I all experienced some form of trauma. And that trauma came from people in our inboxes, in our phones, calling my home, telling me about their perilous situation on social media and trying to do our very best to address it as quickly as we could. And being, being I don't even say overly transparent because you can't be overly transparent, but transparent to the point where it could be used against us and was and transparent to the point where it was weaponized, right? And used from a political standpoint as well, which was unfortunate. But it was something whereby we just, we had to, there were no egos. And I had to do everything I could to support my team and let them know that the accountability was them not acting in that crisis moment. Overall, an approach to failure is also, I have a couple of tools on this front. One, how do you help people know that it's okay to ask for help if you're not headed in the path that you're supposed to be going or you're not about to deliver on time? When I started my career, I was very fortunate. I say I peaked early. I started on the MS-DOS and Windows 95 teams. So I was responsible for a 26 city world tour for Windows 95. And a week before we were about to launch the tour, I did a demonstration to the to the managers. And I was like 24 years old. Why they trusted me to do this, I have no idea. But they did. And it was not what they wanted. And I had not slept in about a week. And because I had just said, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to do this. And my manager said to me, you know, Susie, why didn't you call us in earlier? And he was absolutely right. And I was because I was because I was going to get it done. And I had a friend who created a great tool. He actually has a life ring that he asks his team members to put on their door handles in the days when we actually used to go in the office and call for help. And with no stigma, no judgment, any team member with bandwidth comes and helps. And so how do you create an environment in which help is okay to ask for, in which is very clear what are the milestones en route so that you have those, uh, those identifiers in advance that things aren't going as planned. And then similarly, after you launch something, don't launch and leave, launch and last. And what are the things you're doing to assess accountability and progress? And how are you building in mechanisms by which to course correct and or update things? 
Because all too often we're like, that was a failure. Well, hang on a second. We can iterate. We can get it done. But let's work together to do it. And creating an environment with feedback. So those are some of the things, Giovanna, right? Those are some of the things that, um, that I have used. Uh, if other leaders who are here want to weigh in, I mean, Diane, what have you used in terms of you've been in an environment as a military leader where failures devastating? What have you done because you also have built an open environment? I mean, you used the word grace before, and I think just the concept of grace and the understanding that people are human and always assume good intent and try to do better. Yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Giovanna, yeah. a little bit? Thank you. Great. Next question on this. So um, any thoughts on how to help people, you know, let, let it go, let your failures go, because you know, it's very natural to take a failure very personally mm -hmm. and and it can be with you for a long time and, and you have to move on and it's, it's difficult that, mm -hmm. to, to come to terms with it and and to just to, to move on from that mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, in the past, I personally have had difficulties letting it go and, and I think it's important to talk about, you know, how to, you know, get beyond that particular. Personally, how I think about them is a failure can be a stumbling block or a building block. And for me, I turn them into building blocks. They super suck at first. And you got to figure out, oh my gosh, how do I recover from this? But then it's how do I learn from this? So whether it's social media. So now I've actually done a number of ambassadorial training seminars where I talk about that. And I use it as a way to learn about A, how do you build relationships with influencers in the social media realm? How do you also think about how your language might be received culturally in a place where you're going? How do you take and figure out the bridge between your language and your energy and the place where you are and to which you're representing the country? Um, so that was a building block. And then from a system standpoint, I used a lot of my learnings on failure and the system failure to then go work in the Biden administration to fix the regulatory environment. So how do you use it as a building block? And sometimes it is about this word that we, that we, that we, I think we need to embrace grace more. And that's not just grace with others, it's grace with yourself. But again, if you think, if you think you're the only person making a mistake, that's really hard to do. But when you know that everybody is, and everybody's experienced that in some way, shape or form, it's a little more comforting. It's not schadenfreude, however you pronounce that word properly, um, but, it, 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 it's, it's less lonely. Do you know what I mean? Like, does that answer your question, Andres? Does that map to what your experience has been? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Jessica. So I'm going to ask this question on behalf of Elizabeth Fee, who's in the Zoom room. Um, and she asks, given the weaponization, vitriol, doxing, and death threats that seem to be so common now, how can you still take people who are willing to serve, speak up, do things, and try to recover from failure without paying too high a price? Well, Elizabeth really asked a very light question. <laughs> um, no, I so deeply not just appreciate, but feel that. At one point on Twitter, they said, you took so much from me, and we're going to take your kids from you. We had to have security in front of our house. I understand that as an ambassador having security in front of your house, but as a commissioner for a state agency in Seattle, seriously, um, I hear you. And I, I pray that we are at a place where it's just getting so overwhelming that it will stop. But we do need more grace. I'm gonna go back to that word, grace, not erase. And it's something we need to really dig into and understand because we are holding people accountable in ways that humans can't deliver. Even robots and automatons cannot deliver against what's happening right now. And I may not agree with people, but that doesn't mean I need to be disagreeable with people. And I hope and pray that that can become more of the way of the world in which we live. There's too much anonymity right now in which people hide behind um, various screens and also, there are foreign adversaries and other nefarious entities who are leveraging technology to amplify that which divides us. 
even though those same technologies can be used. I sound like I'm, I sound like I'm a friggin' ad, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> that which divides us instead of that which brings us together. But it's actually true. I'm connected with high school friends that I haven't been connected with in forever. And that's awesome, thanks to Facebook. But this is also a vehicle that is used for doxing and for weaponizing what people say or taking pictures from them from many, many moons ago and holding them accountable to perhaps not the best decision that they ever made after they had six beers on a Thursday night. <laughs> so these are things that, that I think that we all need to wrestle with. And at this institution, I know that that conversation is happening. I just think that we all need to take some responsibility for not just having the conversation, but acting on it. Any other questions from folks? Please, yes. Uh, thank you very much for spending the past hour talking to you about states of failures. I'd like to hear uh, your opinion about uh, Magnificent, making Magnificent and First America. Would you vote for that? Mag magnificent America? Making Magnificent and uh, First America. I don't know what that means. Well, you were, like I say, talking about mistakes and failures. Yeah. And what about the other side? Of the oh, the successes? Right. Yeah. I love our country. I, I think that this is a magnificent place to live, to raise my kids, and to be a part of the civic society. I mean, here we are at the Center for Civic Life, right? Take care, have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was magnificent. And we collectively as a nation, I feel like I've been able to be a part of teams working at the state and the federal and the international level where we did exceptional work. And so I'm very proud, for example, of the work to bring the Swiss model of apprenticeship to the United States. I'm very proud of building a paid family medical leave system that is now being replicated in states across the United States. I'm incredibly proud of the way in which we have an environment of innovation and where we do have more of a freedom to fail here than frankly any place else on earth. And it's baked into our declaration. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend the book, Our Declaration by Danielle Allen, because what it does is it breaks down and helps us understand how beautiful that declaration was. Hey, Carly. Sorry, I just noticed a friend from home. <laughs> and you know, one of the things it talks about that to me is so emblematic of our country that I learned about a month ago. Did you know that in the declaration, there are all these arguments about why we're leaving the king? Did you know that those arguments, the proof behind those arguments was crowdsourced? They put ads in newspapers all across the United States to get examples from people. They had crowdsourcing before crowdsourcing was a word. That's what's magnificent about our country. At least just one example. Does that answer your question? Well, I heard your opinion. Thank you very much for responding. Awesome. Thank you. I want to be respectful for time. We can take one other question. Please, Austin. What's uh, helped you with your confidence in critical thinking in large audiences? <laughs> so a couple things in large audiences or small audiences. Um, I actually have had a lot of training. So Microsoft trained me. I mentioned doing a 26-city world tour at age 24. Mm -hmm. I did 13 of those. And I had to deal with when do things break? So I'll share with you a story. You can decide if it's funny or not. Um, <laughs> there I am in the Astrodome with 5,000 technology enthusiasts demoing Windows 95. And it was in beta. So let's just say you had to do things in a very specific sequence where everything would break. And it was going swimmingly. And then all of a sudden, somebody tripped on the cord. All the power to the, to the screens went out and my meticulously developed sequence of turn this on and then turn this on and then switch this over was completely kaput. And it was right before I was about to demo a game in which uh, one of the characters in the game was using a lasso. So I had to think on my feet. I gotta keep this going while my counterpart is now plugging things back in and getting the sequence going. So you gotta just keep going. So there I am mimicking the lassoing dude <laughs> on stage. And then I turn around to plug something in. And guess what? One of the user group members takes a picture of my derriere. And they put it in their newsletter. These are fabulous moments in a career, right? I know, right? Isn't that crazy? That's sexual harassment. What was that? Is that sexual harassment? Well, it, 
Yeah. <laughs> and it was 1995. <laughs> so at the time it was funny and now you're right. It's actually really not funny. Um, but I think that it was just the photo of me that they had. They weren't calling out and here she is turning around and bending down. Um, but you're absolutely, you're right. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I don't want to be indignant about that moment, but I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Anyway, so I had a lot of training for things like that. And then as ambassador, they, they do, we jokingly call it charm school. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they do training uh, with media training and in other ways, in other ways to engage with folks. But I also ran public relations for Expedia through our EPO, IPO. And for several years, I ran communications there. So I've had a lot of opportunities to engage with folks. And um, so that's how I've gotten that comfort, confidence. And sometimes I have it, sometimes I don't. But most importantly, you should know, I get nervous every single time. And what I just tell myself is, let the butterflies fly in formation. That's my thing. Thank you, Austin. Well, thank you very, very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody on Zoom. I appreciate you for your time. Have a great day. Bye, Mom. Bye, Mom. <laughs>